everybody. Um, I'm Athena Phillips. I'm the co-president of Citrus Chapter, and I want to welcome everyone. And I'm hoping you're staying warm and cozy because it sure is cold outside. Um, but um, if you have any questions or comments that come up during the meeting, please feel free to post them in the comment boxes, and uh, we'll take them as we uh, either do our business meeting first, or then when our future speaker is going, we'll take them as they come in then too. So I wanted to uh, make a quick membership report. We have 132 members. Um, and thank you to all our members who are, conti are uh, continuing to support us during this time. Uh, we have student members and business members, and we have sustaining members, which that's a nice way to provide a little bit of more support um, to the society and to the chapter, uh, if uh, that's within your wherewithal. Um, and we've got the multifamily, so um, you don't have to be uh, uh, a couple, you can, you know, be a multi-generational, you know, family unit, and you can have a family membership as well. Um, I did want to mention uh, one of the things that we still have available, uh, all our little projects that the chapter does are ongoing. Uh, we have the demo gardens that we're trying to do maintenance on. Um, but one of the things that the chapter provides is grants for public gardens. Uh, anyone's able to submit an application to do one. We've got the general uh, multi-purpose grant, which is open to anyone to uh, do a public garden with all native plants. Or then we have one for our uh, chapter members, which is smaller uh, in the grant amount, but it's also a smaller application. It's a lot easier to do. So if you do want to find out more about that, uh, visit our website. It, I believe it's on the homepage, a little blurb about the grants, and you can find out more there. Um, but now we're getting into the season where everybody's going to start wanting to plant plants. And if you know a good location and you have the permission of the whoever owns the property and you're willing to do the maintenance, uh, we'd love to get more public gardens out there supporting uh, native plants. And it's good for businesses as well, um, just as long as they're public. So um, for plant of the month, we're doing a little uh, uh, shift. I did plant of the month last month month and now sue is going to be doing plan of the month so i'd like to introduce everyone to my fellow co-president sue hi everybody all right so um the plant of the month well we were thinking about plant of the month and uh what's blooming and when i looked around my yard the only thing that was blooming is the native violets also known as viola sororia the common blue violet the early blue violet sand violet florida native violet and surprise of all surprises, it is a member of Violaceae, the violet family. It's one of the most common and early springtime flowers. It ends up growing about six inches across and only about four inches tall. It's good in zones three through nine. It tends to do best in partial sun, but it will do well in full sun if, um, if it's got enough moisture in the soil. It tolerates a wide range of soil conditions and it's adapted to natural rainfall variations and it thrives though in moist soil. To propagate the native violet, it's easiest to do it with rhizome division. So there's rhizomes underneath there. All you have to do is dig that up, break them apart and then replant them. Or it generally is pretty good at self-seeding again. There are several types of caterpillars that feed on the foliage, but it seems that uh, the flowers don't really attract anything, any kind of uh, animals, insects, or birds. The young leaves and flowers are edible for humans, and um, they're generally used as a garnish or they can be used in salads, and they're supposed to have a little bit of a nutty flavor. I haven't tried that yet, but uh, that's on my list. So the um, Athena, you have the pictures up, I assume? The, those, the two pictures there are of a couple of plants that I have in my yard. As I said, I was walking around trying to find something that was blooming and I saw this little bit of white. It's a blue violet, but actually these ones show up as white. Um, they are a very variable species. Generally, the leaves are heart-shaped and may or may not be pointed. They may or may not be hairy. You'll notice on the picture on the right that there are no stems and the leaves and flowers come directly out of the rhizome. 
Let me switch over. Here we go. So this is the Florida plant atlas pictures. And here you can also see how there's no stems. The, the, the leaves and flowers come straight out of the rhizome there. And you can see that they are available in purple and white and kind of a bluish or a little bit lighter color. Generally, the throats of the flower are white with uh, dark streaks. And there are actually two kinds of flowers. There's the five petal, about one inch opened flower that you generally see. But then in later summer, after all of the open flowers are done blooming, there are these little closed flowers that self pollinate and only those closed flowers create seeds. And then once they create the seeds, they eject them forcefully, as it said. So I never bought a uh, native violet. They showed up in another plant that I must have gotten from somewhere. And then next thing I know, they are all over the yard. There's some here, there's some there, there's some the other place. And that's because of the way that they throw their seeds out once they have them. So um, if you're lucky enough to have some, then you'll get to see some little flowers early on and see them all through summer. That's great. One of the things I love about the common blue violet, uh, I'm very dry and they, they will grow in shade in my area, um, but they're one of the first spring flowers. It's, you know, they're available for the little critters that need them right now. And apparently they taste nutty. You know, I haven't really tasted them, <laughs> but I, I, I give them to my animals. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much, Sue. Um, that was great. And uh, I, I love the common blue violets there. Uh, there's other violets in Florida, but this is one of my favorites, I think. Okay. Thanks, Sue. Bye. Thank you. So um, thank you, Sue, again. And then our next uh, point of business is that our upcoming activities for Citrus Chapter uh, we did get our uh, February activity scheduled. The, the confirmation for the date came in. Um, before that one comes up, we've got two dates, February 12th and 25th. Um, and then next month, March 20th, we've got an invasive uh, plant removal. If anybody can help out on that, our chapter is partnering up with Lake Beautyberry chapter, maybe Hernando chapter. We haven't heard back yet on that. Um, but the brand new... Uh, trail, bike trail slash walking trail um, called the Good Neighbor Trail. There's a lot of disturbance that happened because of the uh, development of the trail. And when that happens, you get seed germination. So uh, on the good side, there was a ton of wildflowers that have started blooming. But on the bad side, there's also these invasive plants that are coming up. And they haven't gotten a real good foothold yet. So this is like the perfect time to go after them. So if you can... Uh, volunteer on any day. Lavon Silvernell is the one who's organizing it, and she's happy to have people volunteer on their own days. Um, but these are the days that we have scheduled for the chapter participation. So if you can help, please email her. She's also able to give you uh, directions if you can't figure out exactly where to go. Um, then our field trip activity is February 16th at 10. Um, Scott Matthewman, the biologist at the Crystal River Preserve State Park, will be taking us out for Eco Walk Trail in Crystal River. And that's always kind of a nice one that we like to return to. It's got some nice interpretive signage and it's a pretty short walk. So if you can, please RSVP with Ben. Right now he said we have six people signed up for it already. There is a capacity limit on that one of 20 people. So we still have room, but uh, it's barely been advertised and we already got a bunch of sign up. So you might want to Check in with Ben on that one. And then our next meeting will be March 2nd. And uh, Barbara McCormick, which is our famous Barbara Bits person from our in-person meetings, um, we've been missing having her do her presentations before each of our meetings because we're online now. But uh, she has agreed to do uh, Barbara's Bits for our next meeting. So tune in for that. And she'll be talking about um, proper planting techniques and winter pruning because right now some people are you know, itching to do their pruning, but, you know, hold off and listen to Barbara and get the information on when's the best time to take care of all of that. And then, of course, check our website and Facebook for anything that might pop up in the middle of these activities and the announcements. Um, and then also uh, our 
on the Citrus Chapters website, the calendar lists the activities are, that are going on for the surrounding chapters. So uh, you can participate in some of their activities as well. Um, we did get a message from Gail that says the address for Eco Walk Trailhead is actually 5990 North Tallahassee Road, Crystal River. So if I uh, made an error on that, please excuse me. But it's uh, just north of the Crystal River Preserve main visitors in our area. Um, so it's not too far away. Now, <clears throat> as an update, we do have uh, a couple of things. The spring plant sale, which is a pretty regular activity with our chapter. It's our big fundraiser to um, support our financial needs for the year. Uh, we were able to do it last year, but this year it looks like we're not going to be able to do it. So we're canceling the spring one, but we are very interested in doing a fall one. And uh, unless something happens that you know precludes that possibility, we're, we're planning on doing a fall one. Um, but we had one of our members email us and uh, say, well, can we do another plant swap like we did during the summer? And we think that's a fantastic idea. So we're going to try to do that for right around the same time we would have done plant sale. So we're working out the details, location, time, all of that. But uh, if you're hearing this now, start going out into your gardens and looking at what you might have if you have any old seeds or not too old. But if you have seeds or if you have plants you can divide, um, start thinking about what you might use for uh, plant swap and we'll try to get that arranged for March or maybe April, but hopefully March. Um, and then of course the uh, FNPS conference, that usually is a May activity and uh, they are going virtual this year. So it's going to be a reduced, co a reduced cost uh, because it's not in person and the costs are reduced that way. Uh, but there'll be uh, three days. It's May 14th through 16th. And uh, you can go to the FNPS website, uh, fnps.org, to find out more information about that. And then additionally, uh, as far as the society goes, we have fish we do officially have our artwork down for the Florida license plate. If you'd like to support FMPS through the uh, purchase of a Florida license plate, the design artwork has been posted. Um, there's information available on their website, fnps.org. And uh, that's a nice way to advertise your love of Florida Native Plant Society. And you can, uh, you can get that either through the website or by going to the local uh, tax collector's office and just directly pledging to get a license plate as soon as they start printing them. Okay, so um, that basically wraps up our business and I d don't have any more questions. Uh, Jane Newhouse did ask what time will Barbara sp speak in March? She will be our regular uh, featured speaker. So right now it's like 7.13, so figure out quarter after seven and that's when Barbara will be doing her presentation. Okay, so if there's no other business, um, I can move straight on to our uh, speaker. Um, so tonight uh, we're having Nancy J. Bissett. Uh, uh, she's a botanist, a restoration ecologist, and a horticulturist. She's a graduate of the Florida Southern College with a BS degree in horticulture and botany. She's the co-owner of the Natives uh, Inc., a nursery that has been growing only Florida natives since 1982. And she just happened to mention that she has been a founding member of the Florida Native Plant Society since right around the same time. So uh, she's one of our founders. And uh, she's experimented with propagation and growth of many native plants, including grasses, wildflowers, and rare species. Uh, she's developed techniques for restoring many upland communities, including scrub, sand hill, and flatwoods, which um, include container planting, direct seeding uh, of the native ground covers, and weed control. Um, as a botanist, she has helped federal, state, and local authorities find and evaluate rare plant communities, including finding a new scrub mint and a new carpeferous called Pineland Purple. Um, so I'm very pleased she could join us tonight, and I would like to say hello to Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Hello. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm glad to be here and chat with all of you. It's, it's kind of nice to have these online groups where we can discuss all the important things about our plant world. So um, I can begin sharing if you can put me up. Uh, oh, yes. Hold on one just a second. I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. 
we've been we've been struggling with this a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I am going to. Hmm. Now, now I can't move it to the full to the slideshow. <laughs> yeah. How do I do that? Let's see. There you go. Beautiful. Oh, all right. You got it. Thank you so much. This is a new uh, platform that I'm not quite used to. And somehow I'm at the very end of the program. How in the world did I do that? Okay. Uh, I could say close your eyes. Uh, <laughs> let me try this this way instead. There you go. All right. Now we're set. Uh, both the Florida Wildflower Foundation and the Florida Association of Native Nurseries helped me support this talk with um, pictures, et cetera. But I was uh, asked to give this talk related to our book, The Native Plants for Florida Gardens, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago now a publisher approached the Florida Wildflower Foundation and asked if we'd be interested in producing a book like this. Uh, and we were um, limited to a hundred plants that could be discussed or a hundred pages in which the plants were discussed. I was asked if I would join Stacy Matrazo, who works for the Florida Wildflower Foundation in uh, writing the book. So it's been a, a really uh, fun and interesting collaboration. It actually came out a year ago in January, just when the coronavirus was taking hold. And so we really haven't had a chance to get out and sell books personally and, and uh, do book signings and so on. Inside the book is a really nice setup. Besides the full page picture, there's a handy key in the upper uh, corner, a nice general description of where it occurs, ha uh, habitat and range. And the particulars are very nicely grouped at the bottom of the page for very easy reference. While we go through uh, this talk, I am not going to spend any time on special slides about planting, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm just going to talk about a wide range of plants that are in the book. I did make the list of the plants and I tried to balance it for there were South Florida plants, North Florida plants, plants throughout the state, a few plants that just occur in the middle and so on. But when you think about your garden, I'd like you to uh, keep this, one of my favorite quotes from Aldo Leopold in the Sand County Almanac. A land ethic changes the role of Homo sapiens from conqueror of a land community to plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for his fellow members and also respect for the community as such. So we're going to start at the end and beginning of our year. Oh, I did pick out from the book plants that were usable or occurred naturally for the most part uh, in Citrus County. The picture in the right hand, uh, upper right hand corner, however, was not from Florida. It was actually up in North Carolina. But red maples do show a lot of color in Florida if there is a cold snap in the fall. It usually just takes one. Otherwise, the leaves are sort of dry up, turn yellowish and brownish. But they finish dropping off in the spring, which for us is January, the beginning of the new year, uh, with flowers. And then it's followed in February with the seed that hangs in 
clusters that look like upside down hearts. So I actually had a client who called this the Valentine tree. I thought that was a sweet memory he shared with his wife. Um, the red maple does fine in ordinary soil in the yard, but it generally occurs in Florida, at least in our moisture wetter soils. Then comes flowering dogwood in the fall, excuse me, <laughs> in the spring, a little later than the red maple. Um, of course, the bracts, the showy things are not petals, but bracts. The big caution here in Florida is if you are going to use this tree in your yard, get it from a local source. Many uh, flowering dogwoods are brought in from the middle of the country and they do not perform well. They do not bloom well in Florida. That difference in latitude makes a very large difference. So we don't really have pink dogwoods, at least no selection is made of one of our uh, local specimens. This tree, a medium-sized tree with a rounded canopy, has three common names, Musclewood, American Hornbeam, and Blue Beach. I really like the title Musclewood. Uh, you can see on the bark picture and, and others, it almost looks like a flexed muscle. I, I think it's a very apt description. The uh, leaves are, look somewhat like an elm leaf, but there is a difference in how it joins the uh, petiole. And uh, you see some of the seed hanging down as well. Uh, again, it likes moist soils, but it does really well in regular landscape uh, yards. The hawthorn actually was not in the book, but I just had to add it here. It was one of my original hopes. And in the Citrus County area north of there, you have several hawthorns, and they are so lovely in the spring. They are, however, hard to find in nurseries, and you may have to end up collecting the seeds and growing it yourself if you can't track one down. Small trees generally from a variety of soil types. Some have long spines, some have very um, layering branches, almost horizontal to the, uh, to the ground. Beautyberry. The French even liked it and the Europeans. So sometimes you see the common name French mulberry. That's where that comes from. Uh, it it uh, flowers with not real showy flowers, but they're in clusters along the stem. And then, of course, in the uh, fall through winter and almost into spring, you've got these beautiful clusters of uh, berries. And some books have said it's not really a primary food for birds, but from my observations, I don't think that's true. I think the most important thing in using this plant is to give it enough space so it can have that beautiful arching droop to the branches, like you see here. And I figure this is one of our native plants that has made it, because even Disney World has been planting it. Uh, the next is a group of 31 species of hypericums or St. John's warts in Florida. And they range from very wet soils to dry scrub soils. And there's even a uh, plant that's listed endangered by the U.S. and the state. They are usually a small in stature. You could almost shrub this one. Hypericum fasciculatum uh, growing beside a pond can be used maybe at lake edge, uh, pond edge, or even a wet spot in your landscape. 
it is a bit rhizomatous, not aggressively so, and it's very particular about the soil moisture level. If the water level comes up too high, you may not see it for a year until the soil level comes down again. The most usable of all of these St. John's warts are this uh, Atlantic St. John's wort, Hypericum tenuifolium. It could be called a subshrub. It doesn't get much higher than about 15, 18 inches. And how large it gets really depends on how much room it has to spread, how much competition is around it. And I've seen this over and over again. The picture on the top, that particular specimen is probably over five feet wide. And uh, the ones in the lower picture you see are much smaller. Uh, they've got a little more competition from each other and from the moody grass behind it. We usually like to have some low growing plants in our landscape and this one I definitely recommend. Does it occur in our flatwoods? These two, notice are now called St. Andrew's cross because they're four petaled. And uh, the Hypericum hypericoides on the right is uh, fair, I see, I, I labeled that wrong, on the right, is, is a little more delicate subshrub, um, but it likes shade fairly well, so that's a big plus. And it may not be real long lived, but when we're doing restoration, um, for example, an uh, area that's been in pasture for many, many years, this is one of the plants that comes back from the seed bank. The bottom picture, Hypericum tetrapetalum, uh, has a little more rounded leaf and is quite striking as well and, and also tends the seed bank fairly well, but it's a little bit more durable. And here you see the, the four petals, but I wanted, and a bee fly, but I wanted to show you two of the sepals here that are quite matching and quite round and then the two side petals are much narrower. When you see these four sepals, that gives you an idea that that is a, a, a four uh, petaled hypericum. Uh, this too is one of my favorites, which I think has been really misused over time. This is um, Yopan Holly which in your part of the country and up around through the panhandle does very well even with a, a fair amount of salt exposure, not front line. And it likes dry soils and I've seen it doing well even in a little bit of standing water for a time. But if you get the non-cultivar selected, just out there growing on its own, and collect the seed or grow it or get it from a local native nursery, the Latino plants can put out such a terrific abundance of berries. Gopher apple is, is still in this tree and shrub category. I'm kind of working backwards through the book. The trees and shrubs will end up with the wildflowers. But um, Gopher apple is in the shrub category, even though a good part of the branching, et cetera, is underground. Um, once in a while, it will shoot up a bit to four feet, even eight feet high. That's a very rare occasion. occasion. The, the uh, mass pl um, planting, or I think this might even have been natural, uh, on the picture on the right was taken at a home that's next to the shore. And so this is their lawn. We have at least a couple of azaleas in Florida that are usable. The swamp azalea actually is a, grows naturally all through the peninsula. It, it's the one Azalea that you can find in the central and south part of Florida. 
but uniquely it blooms in the summer, July, August, and like other native azaleas, it has a very sweet odor. Uh, find it in hardwood swamps. Again, uh, very moist soil, and again, doesn't have to be that wet to do well in the landscape. And the other one, the sweet pinkster azalea, rhododendron canescence, though it doesn't occur precisely in your area, is usable in your area, and uh, it blooms in the winter or early spring. Again, uh, the beautiful fragrance of our native azaleas, which is missing from the ones that uh, we often plant from China. So I don't think a talk about our trees and shrubs would be right without mentioning our uh, pine trees, which are such a main character of our natural landscapes. The flatwoods used to be the most dominant land cover in Florida. And then there are the sand hills, which also have pine. This is slash pine. And it makes for beautiful walks, especially at the end of the day. And the sound of the wind coming through the needles is, is just part of Florida life. Now, even though we can't uh, probably live long enough to develop a landscape like the picture on the left. We can plant pines in our yard. And one of the positive things about that is it gives sort of a light filtered shade in parts of your landscape. And don't forget the longleaf pine, Pinus palustris, and those beautiful tops on very old pine trees like you see here. It's a special character. Even the slash pine uh, can uh, form those kind of tops, especially on landscapes that are a little drier and a little bit more in South Florida. But I encourage you to plant pines, and if at all possible, the slash pine, or I mean the longleaf pine, which um, has lost a lot of landscape acres in the years since uh, man has been developing. The other major tree category are the oaks. A live oak may be too large and for a home landscape, but you might try the sand live oak which is a bit more diminutive, slower growing. Um, probably familiar with the curled leaves, but sometimes they're not always so curled, but they do have the hairy underside. And like the live oak, the acorns come in pairs like that. Whoops, excuse me. And so then you get the name Quercus geminata, gemina meaning twin, twin oaks. We find them in oak hammocks that are drier, um, sand hills, and scrub. And even in landscapes like this, which was taken up in the panhandle near the coast, where the plants are under much more stress and get these really weird shapes. I left this one in this picture because we, especially in the nursery trade, like to grow perfectly straight trunks with perfectly rounded tops. But uh, trunks like this can have a lot more character. And it's not something necessarily to be discouraged. Um, you can even plant a cluster of sand live oaks and let them work and grow against each other. There are other oaks too, turkey oak. Uh, Citrus County, I know, has a large sand hill area and a lot of turkey oak. Blue jack oak, I think, is one of my favorites, especially when it comes out in the springtime with those pinkish, greenish leaves. 
in Okina oak is one of the scrub oaks and myrtle oak. Uh, and then, of course, when the, you can get into the uh, wetter um, habitat oaks like Schumard oak. Back to shrubs. Virginia willow, uh, a wetland plant, and blooms in the spring with these lovely long bracings. If we see a little bee on the lower picture, and look how pink the big picture is. Sometimes they do have that pinkish character. And years ago, I actually started developing a form like this, which we called Sarah Eve after my daughter and uh, the Woodlanders Nursery up in Aiken, South Carolina bought some. They have since shipped them even as far as China, but in the process of growing our nursery, I've totally lost this particular plant. Yellow anise also comes from wetter woods, and it does reach down into central Florida. In fact, it's right outside my window. It is a large, it can grow into a large shrub, like you see on the left, and in fairly ordinary soils again, in a home landscape, uh, even though where we see it, the soils are much wetter. It can also take sun and quite heavy shade. It blooms in the spring and then develops this interesting uh, seed, uh, seed head that is very much like the star anise from China. And for many years, the regular nursery trade in Florida actually was growing this plant and called it the star anise from China, which is kind of interesting. As the capsule dries, the seeds are expelled almost violently from each of those little segments. Nancy, I had a question about yellow anise. Yes. Because <laughs> one, of the most, one of the most common questions that I hear from people who are new to native landscaping, um, they're looking for an evergreen uh, fast growing shrub. How fast does yellow anise usually grow? I would say moderate. It's not slow, it's not super fast, and, and it's easy to keep in check. Um, but yeah, I would say moderate. It, it's a good choice, especially if you want some screen name. You don't want anything that grows terribly, terribly fast because then you're out there trimming it all the time. Right. And the, the previous picture I showed, that hasn't been trimmed at all, and it's been there, mm, wow, maybe eight years, maybe seven, somewhere in there, yes. Coral bean. In South Florida, they get quite tall. In our area, and where you are, um, they die back to the ground in the cold weather. And then the first thing in the spring, you get this glorious um, uh, spikes of, of inflorescence that just is brilliant, right, right red. Um, and there's the leaves, the half-state leaves. I, I've seen it growing often in coastal uh, sands. And um, when, I, when I see plants doing really well in coastal areas, it leads me to believe that they also really thrive, and most of the bean family does, on a little bit more neutral uh, acidity soils. Though, though we find it quite well in the interior too. But one of the things that's nice about about plants that do well in a little bit more neutral soils is by the time houses have been constructed, 
the soils have been changed and then there's concrete put in for the foundation and for the sidewalks and driveway and so on. And so the soil pH has changed. And so uh, uh, this kind of a plant would especially thrive, just like the gopher apple would. Uh, back to a fall winter scene. This is blueberries, the little blueberries, uh, after they've been hit by a cold snap in a natural setting. And there are two little blueberries. There's a little blueberry up on top that usually has bluish foliage, sometimes more blue than other times. And the shiny blueberry that has uh, bright green shiny leaves. And uh, this one has berries that haven't turned that dark blue black yet. Both of them make very good eating. I like to go out in the nursery at that time of the year. It's easy. You just start scarfing them up. Um, both of them are rhizomatous, but slowly. They're only about a foot to two feet tall, generally. The little blueberry can actually naturally cross with the high bush blueberry in the wild. And sometimes you get this sort of intermediate type of, of blueberry. The little blueberry and the shiny blueberry often grow intermixed. Uh, the shiny blueberry tends to be a little bit more diminutive. And the picture on the right is a shiny blueberry, but both have fairly similar um, flowers that is typical of that whole ericaceae or blueberry azalea family. Ericaceae for ericas are the heathers that we see over in the old world in South Africa. And here you see the little blueberry growing in with, uh, actually there's some gallberry there too, but shiny lionia. And I took this picture in a natural area after it had been uh, burned with a control burn. So the shiny lionia is, is fairly short here, but you see the bright green leaves. And here it is in flower. Um, the flowers on different bushes can actually range anywhere from almost white through pink to this dark uh, rosy color. And another identifying character of the shiny blueberry is this vein around the edge of the leaf. I remember when I first saw the shiny uh, Lionia, I, I saw it in our flatwoods and even uh, scrubby flatwoods. And then I saw a plant in a cypress dome, uh, not often sitting up a little bit on a hummock, but in the dome itself. And I just had the hardest time believing that that was the same plant. The leaf was much darker green, but that vein is an identifying character. It doesn't grow quite as dry as the rusty Lionia, Lionia ferruginea, um, a true scrub plant. There is another one, Lionia fruticosa, which looks very similar in that the leaves are also rusty. Um, the shiny Lionia can sometimes be grown from cuttings. The rusty Lionia cannot. And so these plants are generally seed grown and the seeds are just as fine as dust. So it, it takes a bit of patience to uh, get them to germinate and grow out. I think these two plants plus the other Lionia, Lionia fruticosa, would make wonderful landscape plants in our still underutilized. Um, we've grown them in three up to three gallon plants and, and they just really look super, but almost all of our plants are used in our restoration projects and so they're long gone before we can 
have a chance to move them up. Another name for rusty lionia is crooked wood because the trunks and limbs uh, grow at really almost twisted angles. And when I uh, went out into scrub years ago, I would see these plants chopped off at the bottom and I couldn't figure out what was happening. Well, they're actually being harvested and taken back, the leaves stripped off and fake leaves attached to them and so they were sold for uh, fake plants. Okay, I only chose one of the vines out of the book and that's a coral honeysuckle, Lanicera sempervirens. It has a really wide range into the Midwest and, and a bit up to the north. And in Florida, I see it growing sometimes even in scrub. But I also have seen that it seems to perform best, flower the most, grow the most in our winter months. And then it starts to look a little peaked during the summer. And of course, it's one of the red flowered species that makes a good hummingbird nectar plant. It's a fairly well behaved vine, too, I should say, add that. Um, some of the other vines, like the Carolina jessamine and the passion vine, which have beautiful flowers can get a bit out of hand. I've never seen the coral honeysuckle get out of hand where you really had to work to control it. I chose a few of the glasses from the book to talk about. Uh, chalky blue stem is one of my favorites. I used to call this the little chalky blue stem. Its place in the landscape is, is just as you're coming down from a drier landscape to a little bit moister landscape and usually in, in uh, sand, moist sand. And the names of all of these andropogons were recently changed again. So now it's called Andropogon capillitis. A natural setting. I like to put these pictures up because I think it gives us a uh, key on how we might organize our landscapes when we plant. Little clusters and scatters here and there can sometimes be more interesting and equally as impressive as a mass planting. Many of the grasses are actually sold in tubling trays or single tubing plants, which makes them easier on the budget uh, and also grown in one gallon containers. This is what I call the big chalky, but now it's called purple blue stem because often the base of the leaves, it can be besides chalky, which actually rubs on your fingers as well as a little chalky if you, if you try to rub the base of the plant. Um, but it grows from a little wetter ecosystem. It's a little bit more free in, in reseeding. Uh, so that can be a concern, but it can also be a help. It's now called Andropogon Cretaceous. And again, in a natural setting, as the ecosystem is losing just a little bit of elevation and it's a little bit wetter. But here's a chalky blue stem seeded in a mass. And uh, the... Um, Rayless sunflower, Helianthus radula, really sticks out along with a little bit of blazing star. Uh, this one I think is my favorite grass, split beard blue stem, Andropogon ternarius. Uh, the, the beard, Andropogon is actually translated as Androban and pogan beard, so it's called old man's beard sometimes. But usually that split beard is not split until just before it's ready to fall. Usually the, the 
the, the two parts of the raceme are uh, hooked together. It makes a very dense cluster at the base. Uh, find it in sand hills and flatwoods. So, you know, dry to medium moisture. And it has, when it's blooming, these lovely red and green alternating colors on the stems. The base of the plant, like I said, it makes a really heavy cluster of leaves, but the tops are green and the bottoms are blue. No, well, I got that reversed. Tops are bluish and the bottoms are green. And wire grass can't, can't get by without that plant, which is such a dominant in, again, flatwoods and sand hills and we know it carries fire and so on. Uh, when we do seeding, and I go back and monitor these sites, the one thing I've learned is that it grows fairly slowly as compared to these other grasses. It may take uh, over a five year period, each year getting larger and larger. But, it is a super competitor. Even though it may start out small, uh, it's not um, out competed even by things like big dog fennels. I find that all of the grasses are really quite easy to get established. And uh, if, if um, even you plant the tubelings, uh, it doesn't take too much effort to get them uh, to the point where they don't need any additional watering. So this whole group of wire grass, not wire grass, but Aristida species are called the three awns. And on the picture on the left here, all these little arms hanging out, if you were to take out a single seed, you would see that there, there were three arms that coming out of it. And uh, the bottom picture is actually one of the first sites that we did a mass seeding on. It was 167 acres. And after five years, we burned it. And lo and behold, here are the wiregrass in full bloom. That, that was such an exciting and rewarding moment. Another favorite is the lopsided Indian grass, the Gastrum secundum. Lopsided because all of the seed, this is actually taken from a site that was seeded with a wide um, variety of species. But when the lopsided blooms in October, uh, it kind of dominates the landscape. That's about all you see. Lopsided because all of the seeds hang down on one side. And those awns, if they get moist, will begin to twist and turn. So if you are planting the seed and cover it lightly with moist soil and or water it, the seed begins to writhe. It's like a writhing mass. And that is the technique that the, that the plant uses to bury the seed so it can germinate. Uh, a seeded site, the picture on the upper right, uh, was taken at Bach Tower Gardens where we planted a, a, an attempt to restore a sandhill ecosystem. And at the bottom, that was taken at the Archbold Biological Station. You can see how beautiful the grasses are, especially when they are when the sun uh, backlights them. Okay, now we're at the at the uh, wildflower section, beginning yes. with yes. I, I've got another quick question. Um, Good. So during one of our field trips this last year, we learned that lopsided Indian grass has a cousin, yellow Indian grass. And yes. 
you are the perfect person to ask because you know a lot about landscaping as well as about in the wild type botany. Um, if you were going to plant something like this at your home, is it advisable not to plant closely related species like yellow Indian grass and lopsided Indian grass because you end up with hybridizing or just let love rain and don't really worry about it too much? <laughs> well, there, there are some um, genera that I would be concerned about uh, doing that. Uh, I'll be talking about one soon, but not, not that particular genus, um, Sargastrum. And uh, interestingly enough, of course, lopsided Indian grass has quite a wide range through Florida, but the yellow Indian grass, Sargastrum mutans, I actually saw what I think was the southern limit, which was in Polk County, down where we are. So you are within that range, and you may occasionally find it in natural areas. Have you seen it up there? Yeah, on one of our field trips uh, oh. in, in Hernando County, we saw uh -huh. grass. And then I can't remember where, but I recently saw somebody local selling it. Um, it might have been uh -huh. one of our members. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's in our area. All right, thank yeah, you. I, yeah. Okay. Uh, hammock snake root. I, you know, I <laughs> when I wrote the name out, I, I, I felt like that was the first time we ever saw the words because we just called it Argentina. Um, it's a lovely sandhill plant. It's really fine texture. You can kind of see that from the other two pictures almost has that characteristic of baby's breath. Uh, we planted it for a pollinator garden some years ago, and the pollinators were so highly attracted to it that the client wanted this plant a whole bunch more. The bottom picture, by the way, is from uh, a natural ecosystem down at Tiger Creek. And the upper one, I put that in to show you the general form of the plant uh, in comparison with some of the bunch grasses that we planted at Bach Tower Gardens. And here is another picture from Bach Tower Gardens. You can see at that time of the year, it just sort of sparkles up the landscape. The neat thing about planting all these different species in your garden is your landscape can change so much over the year. Give on, give entirely different looks. Florida green eyes, Mirandiera subacaulis. Leathery leaves. This is, I left the seed head picture in here so you can see it's, it's these seeds on the outside from the ray flowers that actually contain the seeds. Um, and the, the middle flowers do not produce seed. The other interesting thing about it is that this plant can take quite a bit of abuse. Going in dry, sandy soils, it actually has a really thickened root, which can be many inches across. It's a big storage area. So like I say, it can take a lot of abuse. It can be chopped off. It can be go through severe drought and will still hang in with all those reserves. Ah, the Carpheferous genus. One of my favorite fall wildflowers. I'm really partial to it. The first one, uh, Florida paintbrush, it's called. Doesn't look like anything like the Western paintbrushes, but there it is. Uh, sand hills, driest part of flatlands, and uh, has that rosette during most of the year and shoots up in the fall and attracts many, many butterflies and bees, etc., etc. But there are others like the vanilla plant, Carpheferous odoratissimus, and um, the vanilla plant gets that vanilla odor from coumarin, which is the same odor that you sometimes smell when grass is cut farther north, different um, uh, commonly used lawn grass. 
And if any of you have been interested in this book that's been out for a while called Braiding Grass, which is from the uh, Native American tribes out west where they uh, braid a different species of grass. And it also has that coumarin odor. The coumarin actually has quite a long story, but it is the... Um, it is the chemical that is used in Coumadin, which is used to help thin blood for people who are in danger of having strokes, etc. But if you put too much Coumadin in something, they actually have sold it in years past as a rat poison. And if the vanilla plant leaves, which have been collected to flavor tobacco, both for cigarettes and pipe and so on, is smoked. It is actually carcinogenic. So that's probably more than you want to know, but I think the story is fascinating. Anyhow, the vanilla plant has this picture on the top left um, type of flowering um, uh, inflorescence, which is, you see, it's fairly upright. And that the middle picture is the pine one purple, which is the one that I figured out it had to be a new species, even though J.K. Small alluded to it many, many years ago. And it grows just a little bit drier than the vanilla plant, where you see both of them growing together. That only occurs right in the area where I live in central, central Florida. Up where you live, you probably only have the vanilla plant. And from central Florida north, it's vanilla. From pine and purple south of Florida uh, is, is the range for that species. And then there's one other one, deer tongue, which likes moister flatwoods, the wetter hydrate flatwoods. And it blooms just a little later, and it's hard to see, but it's actually quite hairy on the stem, too. I was told by an uh, old neighbor that the Native Americans actually use the leaves to put on their eyes to help soothe their eyes. And that's where the name came from. And there's one more actually, uh, which is called Carcephorus carnosus, which has leaves that are pointed at the ends and look like little stars. So it's called star clusters. So that's the five of them going from driest to wettest. And here's the pine and purple, but in the background, most of those plants are the deer tongue. Okay, the rosemaries or false rosemaries. They're in the uh, mint family, just like the regular rosemary is that's growing in actually in the Mediterranean. Um, these members of this genus, Conradina, grow in several places in Florida. There are actually six species. Four of them are endangered, but two of them are easily grown and easily used. This is the first, Conradina canescens, and it actually uh, has a range up in the panhandle. It makes a really nice, dense, low-growing shrub or sub-shrub tends to bloom in uh, winter, has fairly needle-like leaves. And the other one is a large flowered rosemary, Conradina grandiflora. It grows on the uh, southern, eastern coastal areas of the peninsula. And a uh, large flower, yes, but the plant also is a little bit more red, grows a little bit taller than the Conradina canescens. And it too is easily grown and used. The short leaf rosemary Conradina brevifolia grows in our county and Highlands County along the Lake Wales Ridge. It used to be lumped with Conradina canescens, that first one I showed you. Uh, but it, the DNA was looked at closely, and it's not only 
a different species, but it's more closely related to one of the other species of Conradina. And its branching is, is kind of low and spreading with these little fingers that reach up. So it, it has a very attractive appearance. But the point is, if you're going to use the other two uh, species of Conradina I showed you, uh, don't use them in areas where these four rare and endangered species grow. So that may take a little bit of searching by you. In Citrus County, you don't need to worry. Conradina canescence would be perfect. Twin flower. For the twin flowers, they tend to bloom on opposite sides of the stem, hence its name. Uh, Discharistae oblongifolia makes a really delightful low-growing ground cover. Uh, here it's growing quite compactly, so I think it's got a fair amount of, of, of moisture. It grows in sand hills and a little bit into flatwoods. On drier soils, it doesn't grow quite as dense, but it only gets up to six or eight inches tall. And here are three different species. The one on top, Pineland twin flower, I don't think is being grown commercially. And then there's the oblong twin flower, which I discussed. And the swamp twin flower, uh, I was told by another nurseryman, is really uh, another nice low growing brown cover that likes moist soil and some shade. Uh, so it has a different purpose and works really well. For years, what I heard from the regular plant industry was, well, native plants don't have any ground covers. Well, I, I just showed you several, and, and here's another one, Pineland heliotrope, which can be yellow or white and can make a really low growing mass. I see it mostly a little more coastally again, and I also suspect uh, that the little more neutral soils uh, are good for it. Back. So on the bottom you see the uh, sunshine mimosa also growing and it's our next plant, sunshine mimosa. Beautiful ground cover. However, it will go dormant in the winter and it does need to be contained or it'll grow, continue to grow over the sidewalk or into the shrub layer, which may not be a problem because it never climbs. That's a real plus. And if you touch the leaves or it rains or there's a heavy wind, the leaves collapse. It's, it's got that little land at the base that is very sensitive to movement and will shut up the leaves. I had to put in at least one wetland wildflower uh, that can be used along lakes or ponds or depressions. The very beautiful prairie iris, iris savinarum. By the way, I took this picture up around the coast, not too far from you all just north of steam hatching. The palafoxias are dry land wildflowers. Uh, the integrifolia is almost looks lacy when it blooms. And it's one that occurs all through your area, probably in your sand hills. And here is Pha's palafoxia or palafoxia Pai. It grows a bit taller, uh, actually has a woody stem, woodier at least, and can grow three to five feet tall. What we found interesting this year is that the palafoxias did extremely well. They just seem to be blooming their hearts out everywhere. And in my years of monitoring, I noticed that in some years, one plant will really thrive. And 
another plant may not hardly show up at all. It seems to have something to do with perhaps um, the climate uh, all through perhaps the spring and into winter or whatever happened at that time either encouraged or discouraged a particular plant. Uh, this was the year of Halofoxia for sure. Penstemon, the mini flower or white beard tongue. Sandy soil, sand hills, scrub. Uh, two, three feet tall, very showy when it's in bloom. And you can see it kind of pairs off too, just like the twin flower does. Uh, this picture was taken at where we <clears throat> planted uh, a sand hill ecosystem at Bach Tower. And here's another picture. So you can see its height in relation to the clump grasses. It stands well above it when they are in bloom. And blue-eyed grass, Cicerinchium angustifolium. When we first started growing plants and we brought them to an early uh, conference for the Florida Native Plant Society, I brought some blue-eyed grass. And I still remember a botanist who looked at that. And he looked at me and he says, now I know the world's all right. <laughs> when he saw blue-eyed grass brought in a container, he had evidently done his, um, his uh, dissertation on blue-eyed grass many years before. Blue-eyed grass, it looks like grass, except when it blooms, uh, but you know, it also looks more like an iris. Uh, it's actually a member of its own family, Iridaceae. And uh, it only blooms for part of the day. It needs a bit of sunlight to open up and then it will definitely close before the end of the day. So when people bring uh, plants to an indoor trade show, they usually don't bring blue-eyed grass because they can't ever get it to open up. Often see it on roadsides, but it's a delightful addition to a, a, a home landscape and uh, it's a spring bloomer. We don't have a lot of flowers with uh, that blue color. And you'll also notice in looking at pictures, it usually doesn't show it as blue as it really is. The camera tends to pick up the more violet hue in it. So that was a quick run through of 30 or more plants from the book. And there were a lot more in the book. It was again produced by the Florida Wildflower Foundation, which protects, connects, and expands native wildflower habitats through education, which is a big portion of the foundation. Research, I'm a member of that committee, planting and conservation. And we have been using a wildflower license plate. Somehow I got the wrong plate on here. I'll have to change that out. Our, our, our wildflower plate now shows a, a pink and a yellow coreopsis with a butterfly. But I, I, I know you are pushing the, a new license plate for the Florida Native Plant Society, but maybe you have two vehicles, right? So you can at least do one of each. Since 2000, more than $4 million in license plate donations have supported the Florida Wildflower Foundation. And this has been a major source of income uh, for us. So we urge you to consider it. And, and the license plate as it is now is a much pretty. Oh, there you see it down on the bottom corner. There it is. Oh. I didn't know it did that. <laughs> From Amazon, University Press, or bookshop.org. And 
wherever you buy it, the proceeds will still go to the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Uh, we have been selling it, but since the uh, coronavirus took over, they, the people have been working from home instead of the office, and so they're not shipping books. It should make a good addition to your library. I also need to thank the many photographers who contributed, even though a large number of the pictures were uh, from myself and or family. The essential pictures, especially the really beautiful close-ups, came from people who donated to the Wildflower Foundation or the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. And we urge you to please keep that in mind, especially pictures of whole plants, plants in landscapes, which we are desperately missing, and um, offer to donate them. Uh, you are given credit for the pictures. I'm going to just flip it back one. And um, Athena, you can. Uh, Stop my sharing or open it up to questions or whatever you wish. But thank you so much for listening. Well, we do have a couple of questions that came in. Um, All right. Gail, our past president, wants to know if Garbaria can be cut back now. Um, hers has gotten very woody and larger than she hmm. really wants. Wow. Wow. I've never thought about cutting back Garbaria. <laughs> I would think it's a fire depending. Um, as well, the being cut it reseeds easily. We actually, besides growing them, which is really pretty temperamental in the nursery, uh, we seed them out and they, they grow out from uh, uh, seed when we do our, our mass seeding quite well. I've never had to cut one back, and I guess you could try. I wouldn't cut it to the ground, however, and somehow I just I can't remember. I, I can tell you when I've been at Tiger Creek, originally it was quite overgrown over the years. They have really opened it up, and now there are mass areas covered with Garbaria. But I don't remember them, you know, rebranching or coming from the base like the fire dependent shrub would. So that's my guess. So maybe experiment with one. Right. Adventure right. out of it. That's right. Yeah. Let me know. <laughs> Gail also asks about grasses being cut back. Um, should they be cut back now? Um, oh. Specifically about lopsided Indian grass, muley, and love grass. Mm -hmm. If you need to cut them back, uh, you don't always need to cut grasses back. Uh, you can cut off the flowering stems. They've probably been used by wildlife as much as they're going to. Uh, and trim them that way. If you need to cut out the dead vegetation, what you can do instead is to take a garden rake and, and rake through to rake out the dead leaves. If you really need to cut back a grass, uh, cut it fairly close to the ground, you know, down to two inches or so. Don't do that six, eight, ten inches like they like to do in a lot of landscapes and the plants never grow out very well, I'm thinking especially cord grass and woolly grass that, that are often butchered that way. It's in my grass talk. I do have a grass Russian sedge talk and go into that a little bit more. Or you could the, burn them. Okay. One of the things you that could, I had heard about wire grass is that it's fire dependent for going to seed, but that cutting it back can stimulate the same type of behavior. But would that be a seasonal thing? That you, like, say, wiregrass, you'd have to cut it back in spring instead of now? Um, in a landscape, of course, it's a bit different from out in the wild where you've got uh, wiregrass growing with so many other things and they're in competition. And that, that's a big part of it, the competition. If you are planting out wiregrass in a landscape and, you know, they're spaced, they have a lot of nutrients and moisture and so on to use, and they will actually keep blooming as, as long as those sources are available. 
we planted uh, a gopher tortoise ring of plants and I came back, I think, eight to ten years later, and they were still producing bloom because of that factor. They don't necessarily need to be burned or cut back in a, in a planted landscape. If, of course, you know, you're seeing, you got lots of competition or in a natural area, burning then uh, gives the plant more resources and also stimulates the, the bloom stalks. If you burn too early in the year, you'll get bloom stalks, but it won't produce viable seeds. So that's why we keep saying growing season burns in natural areas to produce viable seed. And that's usually May through July, but you need rains after the burn to, to actually get good seed development. And one of our members, uh, Jane, wanted to say thank you, Nancy. Uh, she enjoyed your presentation. Thank um, you. And I had a question um, because the palafoxia that you put up, I had just heard this year that that's actually an annual. Um, I don't know. 100% sure that's true. I heard it one place. Mm, um, nope. Is, is no. that your experience? No, no. Okay. Um, no, they're perennial. Are there any annuals that are common landscape plants that people need to be aware of that, you know, to give them clear ground so that they can reseed? Uh, well, there are quite a few wildflowers that will reseed, even though they're not annuals. I mean, even Blazing Star with that nice little bulb like. Uh, stem uh, reseeds quite nicely. Uh, one annual that definitely reseeds profusely is the Coreopsis leavenworthii, our state flower. Um, Gaylardia is also a long lived perennial, the blanket flower. However, it's kind of coming over a second look as to is it really? a native in the sense that we use it and that it was present before uh, the white uh, man showed up on the scene and it looks like it wasn't. It was native in Texas, but it was spread more through horticultural introductions. So that's a whole new <laughs> thing to discuss in the future. Yeah, that part of native plants <laughs> is fascinating to me that it's all still very much evolving. And I had heard about the blanket flower maybe not being native this this year. And then um, mm -hmm. the Biden's alba, so possibly not a native plant. And that's the big, you know, promotions on wildflowers, weedy wildflowers, but wildflowers nonetheless. Um, so yeah, and, and, and then there are things like lantana, the uh, lantana camara, which is been listed as an invasive species. And I really think that it's, we would be hard pressed to prove that it did not get to Florida on its own from the uh, nearby Bahamas, et cetera. Right. So there are things we will never know. Well, that is all the questions and comments that we had for the night. So I wanted to thank you very much because this book, I mean, you didn't cover all 100 plants, and it's obviously nope. a really good reference for people looking to plant native plants in their landscapes. So everybody should be checking it out that's getting into native landscapes. We, we really tried to make it as accurate as possible. There were a few corrections when the next edition comes out. Stacy is so good at fine combing everything. <laughs> so I really appreciated that about her. Yeah. But thank you so much so, for being with us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah. I hope to maybe when we get back to in-person meetings, we can have you over for one of your other talks. That sounds great. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Nancy. Have a good night. Good night, you all. So thank you everyone for coming around and joining us. I'm going to throw up our um, activities slide again if you'd like to jot any of that information down. But I uh, hope to see you coming up soon. Good night.